All right. Hey. We're starting. Hi, guys. So, hey, folks. Welcome. This is Steve Duncombe, the other guy. No, that's I'm Steve Duncombe. That's Steve Lambert. Yep. And we are from the Center for Artistic Activism, and uh, this is our – we're back. We're we back. We have not done webinars since, I think, the uh, beginning of the summer. Yeah, so what? What? why is that, Steve? I mean, is it just because we're profoundly lazy, or – <laughs> we have a good justification for it. Yeah, we went to work this summer, and um, there was a lot of traveling involved. I think we did, where did we do workshops? I think we were in Ireland working with sex workers. Um, yep. We did, we worked with local artists in Queens. Oh, we were um, in Johannesburg. Uh, oh, that's right. Sex workers in Johannesburg. And I've been working a lot uh, with drug users. Um, in the United States on the opioid crisis. And we've been working and on developing a whoop, uh, digital application uh, to help artists and activists do their work more effectively. Yeah. So we had to, we had, were traveling and focusing on that kind of thing. And, um, and it's been awfully busy, but now we're excited to be back here doing these webinars. Right. And we have an here. amazing webinar for you today, number 16 of our webinar series. Um, with two people that we worked with a lot um, over the years, and we have these our special guests, who are Jake Dunnigan and Stuart Candy. Now this is they're supposed to be hearing this and popping up simultaneously. Ah, oh, ah, oh, so close. hey, so close. Um, okay. So I want to introduce these two folks. Uh, Jake, uh, wave, Jake, so they know who you are. Hi, that's Jake. Howdy. Jake's coming to us from Texas, um, where he works for the Institute for the Future. And Stuart, who are you, Stuart? Wait, all right, there's Stuart. He's coming yep. to us from Pittsburgh, um, where he's at the Carnegie Mellon School of Design. Um, Jake and Stuart are actually social scientists. They, they, they really are social scientists. And, I mean, it's kind of not real because where they got their PhDs was, one, University of Hawaii. Like, you guys studied a lot there, I'm sure, right? Um, and they actually, the, the program they got their degrees in, and this is really amazing, is in future studies and it's actually a program that was um set up by the state government of hawaii wasn't it yeah there's a a, a a center called the hawaii research center for future studies in the early 70s that was set up and the program uh was started by a guy named jim dater d-a-t-o-r kind of the godfather of academic future studies so uh it's been around a while uh and I think 40 years is a long time, 50 years almost. Yeah, I mean, that is a really long time. I mean, not in the long run of the future, but. Exactly. Yeah. But, like, what is future studies? Because when I was in school, futurists were Italian, and they were um, painters and sculptors and stuff. So what do you mean by academic future studies? Well, you, you were in art school, weren't you, Steve? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, futurists study people's ideas about the future, their images of the future, the story that they, the stories that they tell themselves and each other mm. about possible, probable and preferred desired uh, uh, trajectories of change. And, um, but we don't just study those things, we uh, intervene in them because of course, uh, those images are shaping us. They're shaping yeah. our options, they're shaping our sense of agency, uh, they shape agendas, you know, political and, uh, and otherwise. Um, yeah, and, so and that's how a bit of that's a how I, field. Yeah, I mean that's how I got to know you two is actually not through your academic work, but through your activist work, um, right. and particularly through this activist work that you were doing in Hawaii in imagining other futures. Um, so we've got some slides about that sort of work that you were doing, but you want to give us some context back up and like what was the project there? What were the politics of the project? Oh boy. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll do this efficiently as possible. Yeah, uh, so I mentioned the early, late 60s, early 70s, and that's when a project called Hawaii 2000 was launched. And it was maybe one of the widest, at least percentage wise, deepest anticipatory democracy projects that's ever been held. Uh, you know, newspaper stories every day, multiple meetings across, you know, different sectors of society. So, uh, you know, and, and ostensibly to imagine what Hawaii could be like in 20, in the year 2000, the year 2000 and uh and what <laughs> what uh what what 
preferred future of Hawaii uh, that people would want there, right? So that was that was ongoing then. Uh, but come to 2000, and they got their least preferred future, the one that was overpopulated, didn't feel like Hawaii, had no sense of place, would look like California, a lot of traffic, environmental issues still going on. So uh, the uh, a group out of the, the state legislature and involving other community members launched something called Hawaii 2050. This was around 2005. So a reprise of that model in a way, or at least the attempt and goals of that, and to get it right this time. So when we were uh, brought in, Jim Data was still there, we're, Stuart and I uh, were grad students at the time. We were uh, trying to solve the problem of good foresight, which they did you know, in 2000, but didn't come up with the outcomes that people wanted. So how do we, how do we improve on either the process or uh, some of the dynamics that were involved to make it work this time? And that was where our, the kernel of our motivation to not do reports that get thrown away when the economy goes down or when a new administration comes in, but to do something that lodges an, an emotional connection to possible futures to make people feel those futures in a way that's deeper, more connected, um, and more useful. How do we do that? And that's, that was the impetus for a series of experimentations where we draw from art and, you know, I have a background in visual anthropology, Stuart, and science studies, and and science and technology and law. So we bring all these things to bear to say, how do we actually make a, a positive long-term impact to make a difference that makes a difference? That's what our goal was. Yeah, but it wasn't, that could be like an academic white paper, right? What you're saying right there, but that's not what you did. I mean, why, why the turn towards particularly because you're both social scientists, background in science studies and so on and so forth. Why the turn to using art and visual? Um, well, I think Jake just mentioned the the uh, the need to lodge this viscerally with people, because the the difficulty with thinking about the future, really any future, but especially a longer range one on a multi-decadal time frame or a, you know intergenerational time frame, almost fifty years, right, from two thousand six when this initiative was being launched to twenty fifty, which was the sort of time horizon that, that uh, public participants were being invited to engage with, it's extremely difficult to, to think uh, even granularly in an intellectual way about how the world might look, much less to, to, to feel any sort of emotional connection to it or responsibility for it. So I think we, we had a, um, something more than a hunch, but maybe less than a theory um, that, that what was needed to make this to, to, to take the futures field, which had been in existence already for, uh, for several decades, and in Hawaii, you know, had had this very promising kind of initial um, foray into public engagement with the Hawaii 2050 process in 1970-71, to take all of that uh, sort of intellectual and conceptual infrastructure and make it come to life for people so that they could uh, ex visit uh, a series of alternative pockets of the year 2050 and be struck by the realization, realization holy crap, this, this is actually a world that we might find ourselves in. Uh, and and, and they, they might, as a corollary of that re realization or that insight, kind of see things about that world that they want to bring into being or that they desperately want to avoid. So we had four different rooms and we're, uh, the, the, the slide that's up right now is one of uh, it's just a shot from one of those rooms. It was kind of a so you brought like function. groups of people through four different rooms in a hotel conference center, right? And like each room was a different version of what was possible. Right. Yeah. yeah it was. It was uh, actually the old Dole Pineapple Cannery, <laughs> which had been turned into some ballrooms that were kind of a little bit shabby and down at heel. Um, some of our collaborators uh, on the government side were really keen to have it at the Hilton. Uh, you know, to sort of give this, uh, uh, to, to dress it up as a, um, uh, you know, as a, uh, as a fancy event, but we instead wanted to, to use this kind of much more uh, c closer to the ground uh, kind of place right. and then turn that or parts of it into four different versions of 2050. And that worked really well in so terms of how room? people, so Jake, do you want to? Sorry, Steve. What, what is this room? The, the oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah, what are we looking at? Okay, yeah, so um, 
just just for a little bit of context, we didn't have all of the uh, we weren't in charge of this. <laughs> we, we kind of insinuated ourselves, which we can talk about the the nuts and bolts of that dynamic. Uh, this was done by a uh, 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 an NGO, I guess, uh, within Hawaii a Policy Center that was running it via a, a, a group called the Hawaii 2050 Sustainability Task Force. That was the the umbrella. Um, that in, involved business leaders and community leaders. So, um, so we, we, we tried to like carve out a little section of an overall day that had former governors and people talking all day. So we really only had, I don't know, um, about two hours out of this whole thing. And through, right. so for, four, for 20 minutes, we had uh, out of 600 people, we divided them into four groups and each, each group got to experience two different futures. Uh, you know, we, couldn't, we didn't have time to go to all four it actually worked out better. So this this room is one of our continued growth stories. So this is kind of a status quo world where um, uh, you know we, we continue with kind of the the capitalist model that we have now. Um, Hawaii becomes a tourism center. You know, continued economic growth is the is the logic of this world. And so for this particular one, people came in and they were cast as delegates who were voting for the next governor of Hawaii in 2050. A stage in that election process. But uh, so we had a debate between two candidates, which, you know, you can through the, the, the guise of a debate, you can talk about the issues that came up, events in history, you know, what's going on. So that was nice. But the, the kind of kicker for this one was that the two candidates were actually corporations who, as legal persons, <laughs> by 2050, they were allowed to run directly, right? Cut out the middleman, stop bribing and just run yourselves, right? So uh, we actually did this. This was years before Citizen United. So I think the main thing we got wrong here was that it, it was 2050. This was probably going on in 2030. So we'll see. But so one of the one of the candidates was Aloha Nuclear and Water. So they're obviously kind of representing the energy sector. Uh, they do the nuclear power plus desal for the water. So they're the kind of establishment figure. The other candidate was Kobayashi Virtual Concern, a gaming and design company that had, had created an algorithm that combined all of the best attributes of leaders throughout history. So it's Gandhi and MLK and you know all these people that come together and they had the the perfect a governing algorithm that they would install if they were elected. So those were the kind of dynamics of this debate. And so you can, you, you know, you can see how that represents a world in a, in a way different than, uh, than a paper or a presentation or other ways of doing it. You can really feel the stakes that are involved in the human connection to these things with a little, you know, wink and a nod to some other kind of more provocative types of trends that we're looking at. And what were some of the other futures? Right. <clears throat> well, if you go to the next slide, um, oh, yeah, I'll get it up in a sec. It's the loyalty, security. One. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So that was. Wait, a I still have one of those shirts that you gave me. Oh, yeah, no. Nice. Those are collector's items now. Yeah, that, yes. that, yeah, yeah. Really um, nice. So, yeah, the. Uh, I, I mean, they were based on, on four completely different theories of how change could unfold through to 2050. So, the one that Jake just outlined was, was a sort of continued growth future. Uh, there was another room, which we're just seeing now which was a post-economic collapse. So this was uh, after a, um, basically a meltdown of the global economy and those who saw the writing on the wall uh, got out, um, and, but, the, but the rump of the United States military remained behind and then reinstated the Hawaiian monarchy that the US had overthrown in 1893. And the reason they did that was to sort of, you know, uh, maintain a, a, a veneer of local legitimacy and sort of try to um, uh, stave off the kind of um, well, massive uh, sort of civic dissatisfaction, to, to put it mildly, that you could, might imagine would happen in the wake of, you know, capitalism sort of destroying itself um, and, and many people's lives along with it. So this was a, 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 as people walked into the room, they were essentially cast in the role of climate change refugees uh, coming to Hawaii, which is a relatively well-organized uh, society compared to what is implicitly going on, uh, you know, on the continental, on the continents, thousands of miles away, and they are being um, naturalized as citizens of the democratic kingdom of Hawaii. Um, and then there were there were other stories based on based on uh, other trajectories, a sort of disciplined adherence to sustainability and to traditional Hawaiian values, and a uh, and a post um, a kind of post human technology technology driven and transformation story, but four really different theories brought to life, not as theories, but as experiences that, you know, delight you, alarm you, um, uh, get you thinking and feeling in the present. Now, so both one, of these are pretty dark and uh, complex. Well, so, I mean, so to the point about dark, yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the reasons to to think about futures is to consider 
situations that you want to avoid before you stumble into them unthinkingly, which you know probably would have been a good idea. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, during the election, had we uh, in in the United States had people thought in a little more granular detail about what kind of a world, what kind of worlds, what kind of pathways they were choosing among. Um, but they they were they were deliberately constructed not to be uniformly dark or uniformly utopian. We we tend to find that this sort of experiential work is is about breathing dimensionality into these imaginings so that instead of using these tropes of utopia where everything's great or dystopia where everything's awful, you get to your point, Steve, complexity, where actually there are winners and losers. There are great things about this society, um, uh, certainly compared to uh, a less less bounded, less governable um, uh, you know, landmass, where you can you can work your way up through this society and, and perhaps you know as they say in the induction ceremony here in the uh, the, the, king, the democratic kingdom of Hawaii we want you to achieve all your goals and aspirations do you remember that <laughs> it's nice now I all remember right, you, also, you also well one thing just to and maybe these are where some of the next slides lead that this wasn't all just in a ballroom at a certain point but you yeah. actually took over parts of the city like Chinatown um, and I don't know if we have any slides of that but what was the decision it out of the ballroom and actually into the streets and how did that impact who came across it and what their experience was yeah um, I'll take a, a first stab and Stuart can follow with a better answer but um, yeah so I mean we this this ballroom experience was uh, because that's what was offered to us and that's how this the, the state wanted to run this uh, we are very opportunistic in general uh, we try to find targets of uh, uh, opportunity to affect people and to inject the future into the present wherever we can. So the the Chinatown project came out of a, a very small, a, a shockingly small mayor's grant uh, to do what's called a bright ideas grant for Chinatown. And so it was a little bit of seed money for artists or creatives to to come up with ideas to uh, inspire people there to, to rethink uh, their community. And Chinatown has a long and really interesting history in Hawaii, um, you know, it wasn't a state, so it didn't, it didn't get part of the uh, anti-immigration movement in the 1880s, uh, you know, the anti-Chinese uh, part. So there were a lot of, of Chinese immigrants there. So it's a long history, a couple of bouts of plague in the 1880s and 1900. So a really interesting place to do this, but to take it to the streets uh, is a different animal altogether. So it was already provocative enough to contain 600 people and move them from a future to future. But to put something on the street was, uh, was, uh, 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 less contained, more wild, um, uh, but also our attempt to try to, to, to bring these ideas to people, to make them confront ideas that they wouldn't want to or can't or are not ready for, um, and, and to make that confrontation part of the methodology that we have as well. Not to make people feel stupid or to, you know, to try to, 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 for them to dismiss it, but quite the opposite, for them to, to take it seriously and sometimes you have to, to make it seem as real as possible, and that's what we try to do, to make people take it seriously, even for a, a split second. If it's lodged in their emotional core, if it's visceral, uh, it, you can intellectualize it later. But without that, we find that it kind of floats off. So our goal is to take it there, and we had that opportunity, and, and, and that's where we started that one. And what, so, and what were some of the scenarios that you well, did? Well, I was going to say, there's some slides we can, um, if Steve, you want to put those up. Yeah, so... So uh, to build on Jake's point about the sort of I, the combination of opportunism and idealism driving this work, um, you know, the the Hawaii 2050 project, what they expected of us was to, uh, or what what usually would have happened were um, for convening a conversation about the future is written scenarios that people that distributed to people for them to read and then talk about. And so opportunistically, we said, no, no, let's let's use the space and the time that we can carve out. To, to put people into those futures. So I, I'd kind of forgotten about that, that, that that in a way was sort of the first guerrilla moment, um, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't in the, in the wild or out in the public in, a, in an un, unscripted space. It was, a, uh, it was a, a kind of experiential opportunity snatched from the jaws of, um, of a textual and very uh, standard uh, kind of talky workshop. But then th that worked really well in the rooms, but the, but the state sort of manifested a fairly um, kind of a reluctance to really go as deep with the conversations as they had said that they, they did. 
And so that was kind of what drove Jake and I to start experimenting with going into the streets. So I mean, if you see this, this slide and the last one, and I think the next one, are fragments of, uh, of, the, of the futures that we originally made for a workshop, but that we started to experiment with putting out in the world um, just as, as much as anything to see what that felt like, you know, to kind of, uh, to, to, to drop lift, to put something in a store like this, you know, um, being left in a, in a, um, uh, in a drug store uh, just up the road from university campus. So that, that Kobayashi virtual concern um, uh, promotional sticker for the 2050 election, that's, that's on the back of Jake's car. <laughs> so, you know, he, he stuck that on the back of, uh, of his old Vol Volvo. Um, and so, you know, drove around with that in Honolulu for a number of years afterwards. But then uh, we did a project with uh, postcards, which were created initially for a, co for a workshop conversation about, um, about the futures of, uh, of or the, uh, the various possible fates of the, um, of the tourism industry in Hawaii, the biggest civilian industry in the islands. And then having made those postcards for a workshop, realized one day that we had hundreds of them sitting around in the uh, HRCFS office. And so we spent our own money to send them to people's home addresses, um, you know, sequentially. So they would arrive Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, the, the, the most influential people we could find um, to, uh, you know, uh, senators and, and uh, community, community leaders and gas station franchise owners uh, and, and entertain, you know, directors, um, Hollywood people. Um, who have a who have a foothold in Hawaii, um, basically as a sort of pro uh, to 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 prod them into thinking about this stuff. And then following that, you know, this this project that Jake just outlined, that you were asking about, um, Steve, the the Chinatown one was our was our attempt to go a bit deeper with this stuff. So instead of just a little fragment here or there or a postcard in somebody's mailbox, we turned this you know prominent corner property in Chinatown that had been empty for three years. Um, you know, had not been rented out for whatever reasons, suddenly Starbucks was moving in. Uh, and the reason, for, the reason that, like the premise for that, that came out of interviews and conversations with people, um, people who lived and worked in the neighborhood, was that this gentrification process was just beginning to happen, but, and people were worried about it, but there was no formal, um, there was no political conversation happening about that. It was sort of something that was only being privately expressed. And so we used this, there were several uh, different scenarios for Chinatown that we um, brought to life in the Found Futures Chinatown project. But this one that we're looking at here uh, is, is a kind of manifestation of, uh, of the anxiety about, uh, about the, the change of character of this very long-standing, you know, an ethnically interesting and diverse neighborhood that Jake was just describing. Um, and this forced, forced the issue in a way, and, and it ended up on the front page of the state newspaper. Um, as, a, as an intervention, and we would like to think, you know, led to conversations that otherwise were uh, being avoided. So just to be clear, these are not real advertisements for... Uh, actually, products. this is a real ad ad advertisement, but it's, it's a real advertisement for a staged um, protest. So if you go to, I think, the next... Um, but the... But the it, it can be difficult to tease apart, to be honest, because what we're really doing here is playing with the boundaries between what's true and what is hypothesized. So there's, there's not just a transmedia design space here, there's a kind of trans-reality design space where, you know, in fact, things are going on in Chinatown which are trending towards, in, in this, you know, in this context in 2007, things are going on in Chinatown which are trending definitely towards gentrification, but they, they're not as visible um, as, you know, this kind of accelerated version of it. And so these are our confederates from the Department of Political Science who are protesting the Starbucks going in, That's which correct. in fact was not going in, but it probably would have. Right. So <laughs> one, one, one of our, one of our um, things we always retreat back to our sayings is making the invisible visible. And so in right. a lot of ways, what you all are doing is hypothesizing given what is in the present, these are possible futures and we're going to make them real for people so they can be shocked by them, be surprised by them, be upset by them, or be wowed by them. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, go, there's a, there's well, you're probably thinking of what I'm thinking, yeah, go. I, I suspect I am, yeah, so we have our own aphorism that we'll re respond to you with, which is, it's better to be blindsided, it's better to be surprised by simulation rather than blindsided by reality. And, <laughs> and for these people, yeah, we were... We were talking to people down in Chinatown, and they, you know, like explicitly, I don't want this to lose its sense of place. I don't want change stores to come here. 
But the moment that it was that it was that they thought it was real, and it wasn't just that Starbucks sign. We had dozens of other kinds of artifacts on empty buildings and luxury lofts and things going on. So it had a had a verisimilitude to it that was was fairly uh, convincing. Uh, convincing. So when when people down there thought it was real, their their tune changed. They're just like we always do. Trump selected we reorient our reality to that new reality. They thought these things were actually coming in, so they began to reorient to make the best of it. So, okay, right. foot traffic hasn't come down this street. Uh, with this can actually, you know, drive some more people down to my gallery down, you know, at the end of this uh, road. I like their coffee. It would be nice to have that there. Uh, it's good that people are going to do this live work loft, even if it costs a million dollars. When people thought it was real, they changed that, you know, and, and I mentioned I have a, a background in anthropology. You know that what people say and what they do, it's often radically different. So watching people respond to what they think is real creates a different kind of outcome than just asking them, do you, would you want this? Yes or no, whatever, you know. So that was the, one of the big insights and power of this method that we use. And it might only be for a moment. You know, I mean, um, Steve Lambert, uh, I, I remember your comments on the, um, on the New York Times special edition, you know, that you, um, and Duncan, you worked on this as well, right? The, 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 the um, yeah, so the, the kind of recalibration of reality that can happen just in the split second during which you uh, entertain as a real idea that the Iraq war is over. How does that feel? Where does that take you? Um, it's completely different from sort of from sitting around and, and explicitly entertaining a hypothetical. How would it feel for the Iraq war to be over? I mean, because we don't, we're not that transparent to ourselves as people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I, I just want to point out real quick, like this, uh, it's not normal for people who do future studies to go and intervene in this way. Uh, becoming more normal, uh, but that 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 was the gap that we saw. You know that do, you do good research, you put these ideas together in a very coherent way, and you write a wonderful paper, and nobody cares. <laughs> and what's the point, right? Uh, unless you're on tenure or whatever, like if you're just doing it for yourself. We want to make a difference, right? Um, that's my favorite definition of information from Gregory Bateson: a difference that makes a difference. So how can we make information? as defined by that from the future, make a difference in the present and have an effect. So that's, that is implicit in what we do. So, so let's get good at it. Let's, let's not just wring our hands over the fact that it's not working. Get out there and try some new stuff and, you know, uh, as gently as you can punch someone in the gut to make them pay attention if they have to, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, but really gently. We want to make right. that clear to everyone. Yeah. All right. We call it shock uh, therapy sometimes. Where, where do you want me to go as far as these slides? Or do we want to talk more about well, the Chinatown if you, stuff? If you, just, if you click through a few more, we can probably just make the point that, you know, that, that these initial experiments were kind of like, yeah, so that's another Chinatown one, uh, about what becomes of Chinatowns in a world where China is the, is the preeminent geopolitical superpower. Um, you know, because there, there are Chinatowns dotted around the world, and and of course there's there's this one in Honolulu where we were where we were based and that we were focused on, um, and so I, I won't go into to detail about that. It's kind kind of decoding it um, culturally, but but just to say that you know when you are working in this register, you're working in and Jake's alluded a couple of times to the sort of anthropological dimension of this work, both in its sort of background inspiration in some ways, but also. Uh, in the methods we we used was sort of quasi ethnographic talking to people <laughs> about what they um, you know what their perceptions are of the past of the present of of the of the future or futures and then working with that material to uh, to be able to intervene in that mental environment um, with a, okay. with something resonant that that something resonant that makes sense for that history that location that culture um, and there are, there are all kinds of details in each of these artifacts, and they're mostly print because print is cheap and uh, low risk to stick up on the wall, you know, even if someone <laughs> pulls it down 30 seconds later, which has happened. Which they <laughs> do us. sometimes yeah, when they you don't do. ask permission. Right. But so, yeah, if you kind of click through these, you'll see other bits of uh, bits and pieces from that uh, coming out of that agenda of experimenting with a kind of, um, you, know, with, you know, with everything we can think of and afford and cause to make happen. Yeah, well, so one of the things I like about this is, we ever made. is that we often think about interventions as these things that are going to take a lot of time and a lot of money, but a lot of this is actually relatively low tech, which is you print up some posters and you print up 
postcards and you know warrant notices and so on and so forth and you can actually transform a space so it feels fundamentally different like as if something else had happened which is not necessarily of the present and do you right. have any tips for a lot of the people that um, a part of these webinars are artistic activists and like mm -hmm. how would they can you know what have you learned through your experience that would help them do this sort of work on their own uh, lots um, of things. <laughs> yeah lots yeah. of things I mean I this is Jake. You can think of something really pithy while I'm blundering my way through this, but um, <laughs> I, I think there's. I think you need to understand both the context in which you're intervening really well, and ideally understand the future that you're proposing really well, so that you can find a way of meshing the two. Uh, because in a sense, what a what a guerrilla futures intervention is is a sort of unsolicited portal into into a hypothetical situation, um, and in order for that to work, it kind of needs to fit. Uh, it needs to fit both the, the, the literal location where it is being put in place um, so that sort of organically uh, suits it, um, but it also needs to fit culturally and, and if you like, you know, psychologically with the mental models of, um, of the people you're trying to reach. So I mean to give you just a quick example of how, you know, this has grown into other kinds of practice, quasi guerrilla futures practice, I guess. We just, the, um, the lab I run at CMU just, just did a project for uh, the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. So uh, it's called the Situation Lab and we, we design situations. So one of the situations we designed is based on this thing appearing under the, uh, uh, under the hotel room doors of delegates at the um, big meetings that they have every couple of years when the, you know, basically every country on the planet has a Red Cross or Red Crescent Society and they come and talk about strategic challenges and opportunities looking out, you know, 10 plus years. So this invitation, you know, it says a global network 2025, you're invited in like six official languages and then you sort of open the seal here and I broke it. Inside is an invitation to the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony in 2029. Um, and the winner is the Global Red Cross and Red Crescent Network for establishing a global foresight network to anticipate and prevent humanitarian crises. So what this is doing, the, the, the Red Cross has won, uh, or you know, in its various forms over the years, has won uh, three Nobel Peace Prizes. Actually, the founder of the Red Cross won the first one that was given in 1901. Now, they haven't won one since the 1960s. Um, and there are all kinds of, you know, changes going on in the landscape, of course, in, you know, the landscape that we all live in, but also the, the, uh, the landscape of humanitarian response um, with, with technology companies like Facebook entering into the space, um, you know, and, and providing donation mechanisms, all this kind of stuff. What we were trying to do was to create an asp a moment of reckoning with an aspiration rather than with, some, you know, alarm about how things could, uh, could, how they could steer the organization in a desired and fruitful direction over the next, um, you know, decade plus. So uh, that, that's one of the, one of the pieces that we produced. But in order to understand, uh, in order to do that, we needed to know quite a bit about the organization, about what, what the sort of, what language to put it in, not just literally, although that too, um, but, uh, but figuratively, how, what sort of, um, how to signal the kind of uh, uh, you know success in a way that would that might register right. with people in that, in that uh, in that context and um, and so that yeah there's sort of a, a question of meshing I think the um, the the world that you're oh I know of course this was designed for their conference and so we needed to know where can we gain access to yeah. at the conference venue where things won't be um, uh, you know, disapproved of or pulled down instantly or, or whatever. So at one level, this is a sort of hybrid guerrilla futures thing, at one level it's approved because, you know, we were doing this in partnership with, with a foresight unit within, uh, within the International Feder Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. At another level, as far as almost all of the thousand delegates at that event were concerned, this is not something they're expecting. This is an unsolicited encounter with the future. So I think that meshing is a kind of important principle. Mm -hmm. So if I can just, uh, I will do this relatively quickly. I mean, I think for practitioners, one of the things we found, if you think about archaeology uh, uh, and artifacts in the future, that's what we designed. That's part of what we design. We, we want to create a situation or experience, but often we do that via artifacts. 
if you're an archaeologist, uh, a, a potsherd may contain more information about the world of an ancient culture than a throne room, for example, right? So you can do a lot with a little. So the, these pieces are, as Stuart said, windows or doorways into this world, and you don't need to do something extremely, you don't have to do all of the, uh, all of, fill in every gap. Um, uh, was it Peter Morville? Uh, it's, it's better to be, uh, or what does he say? It's uh, um, the disturbing oh, hole rather than the pacifying hole. Yeah, sometimes it's better to have a disturbing hole, H-O-L-E, uh, rather than a pacifying hole, W-H-O-L-E. So have, you know, giving people that invitation to, to imagine around that artifact. And what's interesting is archaeologists go and they find an artifact and it, that's in place and then they you know, make a story about the people that live there. We are injecting artifacts into a place and making people respond to those. It's sort of, it's a, uh, you know, a hybrid, I mean, a, a reversal in a way of that process where we are introducing artifacts for the people that live there to respond to so that we can learn from their response to that, which is a, a kind of interesting and complex process, but a fun one. And then just really quickly, and then just use, use genres that exist. So we talk about culture jamming and future jamming. You can do a lot, you can carry a lot of narrative weight uh, and a lot of uh, uh, understanding can come through the genres you use. So advertising. You know, we're looking at a at a vending machine, right? If you if you have a if you keep a, a genre stable and then input really strange content, that can be a very powerful way to 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 help people understand how am I supposed to think about this thing? And, and in the reverse, you could have something very common, uh, you know, uh, an invitation or a wedding, uh, you know, invitation, but do it as a neural interface. So you could take you could hold the content very familiar, but do it through a new medium, and that's also a very effective way. But if you do both together, we found that's that can be trouble. People can't really grok what's going on. Yeah, it's when it becomes, you know, we always say that the line between legibility and illegibility, and you want to really ride that line because it's at that moment that you generate surprise, but a surprise yeah. which can be resolved that's as opposed right. to a surprise where you throw up your hands and go, I don't get it. I'm out. That's right. Yep. Dismissal, that's our enemy, you know, and, and confusion yeah. and complexity can be a, a, a vector to dismissal. So I think what we're going to do right now is just um, turn to any questions that people from the audience ha might have for you, and that can be things like a project you're working on, or they can be general questions, really anything that we, you know, we have this good fortune to have these two brains inside our little square box here, um, and so we're going to pick them and maybe pull them out of your ears and nostrils like they did the mummies. So while we're... Those of you that are um, in attendance of the webinar, if you want to enter in questions into the chat or into the questions area um, in the GoToWebinar interface, we'll look at those in a moment. It usually takes a few minutes for people to type those in. So in the meantime, um, I wanted to ask you guys, what are some of the methods that you've come up with with groups or amongst yourselves to help you come up with the these visions, right? Like mm -hmm. to imagine, um, like, you know, right now, I think for a lot of people, imagining um, what the country would be like without Trump, right? Whether that's hopefully um, in four years or less or three years or less, uh, but like what that would be like. Um, um, or that that would be even possible, right? Like the, the, there's so much baggage and, and, um, and emotional, uh, you know, a mess attached to it that it becomes like, oh, I don't even know, you know. So that you got to have come up with tools to help people sort of get out of the, the probable, I, Stuart, you've talked to me about this before, like the probable future, the possible future, you know, like how to expand what the vision of the future can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that sort of typology of possible, probable, preferable is, is one of the um, uh, longstanding kind of pillars of, of futures practice. And I think it's helpful because um, that's actually recognizing um, that, uh, that if, let's say, the conversation that you're interested in, in contributing to is monomaniacally focused on what is most likely, right, on the probable, which is very common, actually. You can sort of um, uh, use that to push off of, say, okay, what, what, what's called for here is something to contrast with that. And really, the, the whole field of futures studies um, is, uh, or many elements of it, are about answering that question. You know, like, how do, how do you um, not just map what is found, but generate 
fruitful uh, alternatives. But I guess, I mean, among the tools that we've uh, developed in the course of this work, this experiential futures work, and then guerrilla futures within that, I think one of the slides you'll find there is a kind of a, a diagram with these four bubbles getting smaller, sort of a, a, in a ladder from top to bottom, the experiential futures ladder. And that actually emerged from a, uh, from a, uh, a project that Jake and I did um, at uh, Arizona State University at, at a, a festival called Emerge in 2012. We had 20 people in the room. We'd never met them before. They hadn't necessarily done any futures work before, or at least actually a couple had, but, uh, but not experiential futures work. And uh, we realized that to help orient the conversation, we needed to have a language for um, what sort of level of concreteness or level of abstraction our ideas were sitting at. So an, an idea for a future, uh, you know, like, oh, a, a future where Trump isn't president, right? But, uh, to take your example, that would be at the setting level, right at the top here. But in order to sort of to parlay that into something concrete and performable, like at a one-to-one, -one, and I don't just mean performable in a theatrical sense, I mean, you know, materializable, uh, like, a, like a, a lot of the, the artifacts we've, we've been talking about, you need to make it less abstract. I, you need to ask what if in a more granular way. So what's the scenario? You know, by what means does this, uh, does this shift come about? And then, you know, try to tell that story. And there's going to be a bunch of ways in which you can tell that story. And then w once you have a story to tell, you can kind of cross the experiential gulf into sort of thinking, all right, well, if this is the world that we want to locate people in, what part of that world can we bring to life now? And that's when you get into the situation and the stuff. So even though this, this might all seem very self-evident, I, I, I think it is, or, or it should be, um, even See having it. a language for, well, no, I mean, I'm not saying the, the words are all like, um, the, yeah, there's a certain amount of arcana here. <laughs> but this is no, our, no, no, it's this not is the word, it's the process. The like, the, well, yeah. the thinking this through, like, when yeah. you put it in a visual like this, it's like, oh, right, but. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, um, yeah. Our hope is that this kind of thing becomes self-evident and easy once it's pointed out. But it, but it certainly isn't self-evident and easy when you're first setting up to try to do it. And, yeah. and so in a way, what, what a tool like this does is help you, um, help you climb down that ladder from your abstract hypothetical. This is the kind of world that we need to be talking about. This is the kind of scenario that ought to be uh, part of people's you know, repertoire, uh, part of what's imaginable, part of what's on the table and drill down until you get to something you can create that is uh, redolent or kind of um, uh, evocative of, uh, of, the, of the broader point. So we got some questions coming up. Um, and here's one from Ryer. Um, can you guys talk about how you capture or make use of the public's reactions? Like, when public reacts in a certain way, well, then what do you do with it? I mean, where do you move it? Yeah, and this, uh, this might address uh, Christina, one of her questions, do we consider ourselves artists too? Um, we've been talking mostly about the, really what is the invitation? The, all of the performance, the artifacts, all of that is an invitation to a better conversation or a deeper or a, a more surprising, useful conversation about the future. So that's everything to us. The work is really just to, to grab attention, to, to get people to pay attention in the right way, and then to frame that, the, what later is a, a conversation about the future, futures, uh, in a proper way, or that we think that, that resonates with people, that accounts for their history. So uh, we capture it multiple ways. Um, uh, there's in, in the, the room workshop, so we, we talked a lot about Hawaii 2050. Those, they, they, people went to two different futures for about 20 minutes each, but then we had a, a uh, um, over an hour long conversation after it at tables where there's a facilitator with 10 people there and we talk about what it means because this is everything right you just don't put something I'm not I'm not trying to belittle uh, or, or generalize about artists but in this way you don't put something on the wall and then walk away and that you know whatever happens happens right we have to we have to structure the design of what we're doing as a process that includes these artistic devices but um, we we have to design the conversation that comes out, out of, after it later so Everything from workshop, graphic recordings, to notes, uh, to reports that we write, to summary videos, uh, to websites that we send people to have a conversation, other platforms that we, we you know, sort of hop platforms along the way. So all of those are, are ways that we try to, to, to capture uh, the inputs from people and the ethnographic work Stuart mentioned as well. So going out there and just, you know, you, you put a, a statue of harmony 
the, the Pacific version of the Statue of Liberty that China gifts the U.S. and you put it in Chinatown and you, you that's the, the initiation of a conversation of which you are, are capturing in different ways. So some of it can be sort of from the wild and others can be more contained in a workshop setting. Um, uh, and then feed it back to the people that were involved and decision makers to, to give that back again. So it's a really, it's a cycle where these things come, we introduce futures to it, we have a conversation about it, we synthesize that, pull insights out of it, feed it back. Uh, that may change the way we think about scenarios of preferred right. futures. So this is, it's an ongoing process. It never, it, it never ends. There are episodes that happen, but it's, it's, it's a continuous process, at least in its, in its ideal form. Right. Yeah, so we um, see a lot of parallels here with uh, theater. You know, like if you were a playwright or a performer, like these things would be um, a lot more familiar. There's a yeah, there's a and, bunch of really good questions coming in here. What were you going to say, Stuart? Well, I'm just going to say, you know, and through the lens of each of the different um, media that that one might draw on, you see different ways of thinking about what documenting or capturing or evaluating a project looks like. Because of course, you know, if you if you're uh, doing a show. You, you get a lot of anecdotal feedback. You're not necessarily having people fill out a, a survey um, after, you know, when the curtain comes down. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the, in publicly oriented projects, the press that it gets is one of the, um, you know, is one of the, not necessarily indices of success, but it is a, it is a place uh, to see what impact has been had. And you can find that, you know, for projects like the Found Futures Chinatown, uh, for Nature Pod, which was an interesting one that, we, that the Situation Lab did a couple of years ago, uh, at a in a um, a trade show environment, we launched a hypothetical product from a few years away as a probe um, to uh, and, and people we interviewed people on camera about their responses, and they thought they were responding to a real product rather than to a hypothetical. So that's another way of capturing it. But the affordances of the of the place where you're doing the intervention are different depending on what that place is. Right. Um, Jake, Maida had a, uh, I think, sort of a follow-up question. I'll add another piece from, um, uh, I think it was uh, Bryn, was like, um, do you have any, how do you shape, attend, and take care of the quality of those conversations you're having with people? And Bryn wanted to know if there was anything specific. She's working with teenagers. I'm assuming Bryn is. No, anyway, um, working with teenagers, is there anything specific or ideas you have for, for working with young people? I'll, I'll answer that first and then Stuart can, can add and, and answer the other one as well. I mean, I, I don't think I've talked to you, Stuart, but I had my son, my nine-year-old son, Dean, do Thing from the Future. So you all, people listening to this webinar should go Google the, the Thing from the Future from Situation Lab, and it's a step-by-step -step process to to do this kind of futures imagination and artifact generation that's based on futures methods and it's all embedded in that. So it's a great process. But, you know, I have a well-worn pack sitting around and my son said, what's that? You know, and the fact that it kind of came with uh, uh, the word game. Oh, it's a game about the future. Oh, I want to do it. So uh, that framing worked well for him and he came up with some amazing ideas doing that. Uh, so, you, you know, you have the archetype of the future, you have what you're designing, you have the sort of territory or topic that you're covering and a mood card that tells you the feeling of it. And so, uh, so a couple of things that it's, that it's structured, you know, where do you want people, to, where, where's the variability that you want to add, right? You can't make people imagine a different world and then have different characters in it and what you're supposed to design. So if I say, I want you to design a gum wrapper in a transformed world, in a, in, a, in a collapsed world 50 years from now, um, where the mood is uh, embarrassment, right? That gives you some handrails to do the design. And again, these things are, are kind of simple on their surface, but they have a lot of hard-won experience and methods and, and theories and the trial and error that are embedded in that. So um, the, for young people, they are ready to do this. I mean, I know it's a cliche sometimes. Oh, they're not, you know, they'll have the future driven out of them. But uh, we don't have to decolonize their imaginarium so much as you do others uh, who are kind of stuck in a rut or, you know, uh, other ways. So I think kids are already primed for that, if you think about it, like a new language, really. Um, and give them some of these handrails, uh, you know, the, the gaming frame, uh, the fact that we're, it's a card game, you know, that really helps. So if you, can, if you can put it in a known vessel and give them the license to go, but know where the variabilities and, and where their creativity can be most effective, you know, design constraints kind of concept. Uh, I think those are some effective ways. I, I, I would love to see more kids. I mean, I already knew that, but just seeing how excited and creative my own son got from doing this process, oh boy, a lot of untapped potential there. Yeah. Real quick, 
Uh, Patricia wanted to know when the thing from the future is going to be available again. <laughs> yeah, we've actually just finished the In the future. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm out now. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. soon. I, I just wanted to say that when you're doing this with people who are new to it, um, the, uh, whether they're teenagers or not, um, deliberately embracing constraints like, say, um, making the form of output just posters, uh, so, let's say, uh, something that, that they maybe are uh, comfortable having a, sh having a go at, um, especially if you're with a whole group and they can sort of learn from each other in parallel, rather than sort of everybody doing something completely different from everybody else, which is harder to maybe support successfully as a learning activity. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I'm with Jake. I think actually it's, it's easier for kids to, to do the imagining part, the making part, they might need a little help, and probably the installing in the world part, they could use, um, uh, you know, well, whatever, whatever uh, constraints of safety and legality um, need to be reinforced. Um, underline those, but, you know, I, I, would, I would encourage them. I think one of the most fun workshops Steve and I ever did was in an uh, elementary public school here in New York City. <laughs> Working with remember third graders about mm -hmm. imagining yeah. their, their utopian school, and they were mm -hmm. like, "Okay," and just kind of went off on you know, I know it's a school. We hear the problems of the school. Now I'm going to imagine the future: flying shoes, because we don't like to climb up, you know, twelve flights of stairs, and the elevator's mm -hmm. never working. And it was mm -hmm. great. Um, yeah. So another question. This one's from uh, D uh, Danny, I think. And it says, do you think gaming can be an effective, effective as a tool for futures in terms of experimenting with different scenarios, or is computer gaming a step removed and not effective for lodging into the emotional core, as you say? That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, yeah that's a good question. I, I, kinda, I saw that on the list and was thinking about gaming as I answered that other question. Yeah, gaming is, uh, they've managed to uh, understand engagement and, and how, do you, how do you keep people paying attention to your game? How do you get them involved? So uh, the tools and techniques of, I, I, would, I would get away from sort of games themselves, video games, but the techniques of gaming where you level up, where you learn the rules of the universe by playing, where there's multiple tracks that you can go. Um, I mean, Stuart has a, has a lab called Situation Lab, uh, which, you know, putting people in the situation and helping people co-create, I mean, I think that this theme is coming out as well. Not just giving people a world and you're a passive observer, you're, you're a climate refugee, or you're you know, this or that. So games have a good way of, of both telescoping between a very personal, life or, sometimes life or death, but there's stakes involved in that, but also a bigger world that exists around. And I think great scenarios and great experiences do that. You have a feeling that connects to you as a person and you have some role to play there, but you're also seeing a bigger picture of what's going on and you can, you can toggle or telescope between those two things. And I think gaming uh, is, is, has a history of doing that very well. Yeah, uh, our last this is is, is, uh, Edward, the um, information designer from Yale um, uh, talks about, you know, what's the best approach to communicating information? And his, his answer is whatever it takes. And that's, and that, really, that, that's really the answer here too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, I'm going to, unfortunately, we, we could talk for another hour and a half, um, which we have done, usually with libations. Um, yeah. uh, and then the the talking doesn't become quite as intelligent, but it becomes much more animated. Um, but we, can, we can't do that here. Um, we actually are at the end, but we want to um, put up some information about how you can contact both Stuart and Jake. Here are their websites. Um, and, you know, I'm sure they would love to carry on this conversation with everybody who's out here in webinar land. Um, on more intimate scale. Both of you have done a lot of projects and I imagine some of those projects are on your website and you probably have ongoing and also future projects which you'd like to share with people. So we encourage people to reach out to Stuart and Jake. Um, it's been amazing having you two on the air. I mean, have many private conversations with you, um, but yeah. it's always a pleasure. I always earn to, I'm writing stuff down. Um, better to be surprised by simulation than blindsided by reality. Is that it? Um, that's it. That's a good one. It's a good one. Um, <laughs> Steve, what, what do we have coming up? Well, um, in a few weeks, we've got another webinar with uh, someone from our board, actually, Terry Marshall. 
Gary Marshall, who is the co-author of the Black Body Survival Guide and also one of the founders of Intelligent Mischief, which is uh, an arts activist design collective, formerly out of Boston, now has moved down to New York. And, and I, I put in a string of links if you want to register for that webinar, get away from your family um, after the holiday, <laughs> holidays and like hide out in the basement and learn about some stuff. You can register now. Uh, if you can anticipate that happening. Um, another thing we got going on is um, after after a long pause, uh, we are recording another podcast. Yeah. So yes. for those of you that don't know, Steve and I did a podcast, like 10 of them, where uh, we go out and do popular things, and then we analyze them and look at what we can learn from doing those popular things. Right. I, so I wanted just... to say to you guys, I really enjoyed the pop culture salvage expeditions, <laughs> and um, I was kind of sorry that the not to be on that, but this is awesome well, as well. No, believe me, we'll bring you back in on that. But you gotta and I also want to yeah. congratulate you on your all-male panel. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with, with beards. You forgot the beard. Yeah. 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 The there, are, yeah. there are lots of non-white bearded men doing this work, and please seek them out. Uh, uh, thanks for having us, but we are not representative of the overall uh, movement of the panel. <laughs> so please seek those out. Um, and with yeah, this, yeah. this this podcast is going to be no, brunch. Be <laughs> and what what can what can activists learn from brunch? And the best part of it is we have a special guest, which is Steve Lambert's mom. Uh, so that's yeah, so it's not a beard and white guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks for <laughs> so, thank you for having we're us. We're recording guys. that on Sunday, and that'll come out uh, shortly after. Um, there's a link to the podcast. You can subscribe. There's ten episodes up there now. If you haven't heard them. Um, with all different kinds of people. And um, and the last thing is um, we're trying to do our end of year sort of push here with donations. So that's the URL to donate to the Center for Artistic Activism. It is a uh, 5013C tax deductible donation, though I have not looked at the current um, bill that's gone through the Senate. We don't know how long this will last, but for now, you can write it off. Well, all, all the billionaires that are getting your tax cuts, they now have a place to put their extra money. So, exactly. they, and there's many of them in this webinar, I know for sure. And if you become a subscriber, meaning like you uh, give a donation of $10 or more a month, we will etch your name into a brick that will go into the new Center for Artistic Activism headquarters. And, uh, you know, I have to say this every time, full disclosure, we don't have a headquarters. And we have no plans to build a headquarters. That's why we will in the basement. <laughs> yeah, and it will go. It will we'll keep it around. If you ever do make a headquarters, your brick with your name on it will be at the headquarters. But there is no plan right now. But we will make the brick. So, um, so you can make that donation um, at our at that link. And um, yeah. I just want to thank you guys again. Yeah. Yeah, it's thank been really, really fantastic. Always a pleasure. Great to share you with everybody else. And for everybody who came here today, thank you, thank you again for, for giving us an hour and your wonderful questions. And stay tuned for future developments. All right. Yes. Thank Aloha. you guys. Aloha. Keep this waiting. Is the moment. <laughs> How do I stop this? I forget. Okay. <laughs> Uh, bye bye. Bye. <laughs> we love you all. <laughs> oh, Jake's gone. <laughs> I'm leaving too. I'm just waiting for this recording thing to stop. I'm going. <laughs> bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs> See ya. Steve's alone now. <laughs> I don't know. I. There. Oh. It's just you and Steve. Right, yeah. I have the, like the spinning beach ball. I have to wait. <laughs> I gotta go. <laughs>